Hello, everyone, and welcome to Growing Green, a program sponsored by the League of Women Voters of HAM. Thank you for joining us. Before I go any further, I'd like to mention that this is being recorded. So if you don't wish to be seen, you may turn off your video. It will be posted on the League's website and possibly shared by Harbor Media. My name is Nina Welford, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Hingham, although I now live in Cohasset. We have over 70 members in Hingham, Hull, Cohasset, Weymouth, and Situate. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization, which means that as an organization, we do not support or oppose candidates or political parties. We do encourage informed, active participation in government. And as a nonpartisan national organization that's been active for over 100 years, the League researches positions on public policy issues that affect all areas of our lives, including voting rights, education, criminal justice reform, family issues, health, and of course, the environment. We educate and advocate at the national, state, and local levels for legislation that supports those positions. And we also try to take specific actions in our own home communities. So in January, the Hingham League sponsored a really informative webinar with speakers from Hingham, Hull, and Cohasset about the effects of climate change in our three towns and what we are doing about it. Two of our three state um, legislators listened in and shared progress being made at the state level, especially with the new climate bill. You can watch that session on YouTube through our League website, uh, which is, it was recorded on Zoom. So this program, Growing Green, grew from those, those discussions. Some of us are avid gardeners and more of us want to get started. So how can we each contribute to the health of the environment through our own little patch of green or brown as it may be? So with us today, we have three local experts in overlapping fields, each with a passion for using good green techniques. We are so pleased to have John Belber from Holly Hill Farm, Todd Breitenstein, who is the Grateful Gardener, and Kristen Nicholson, co-founder of Blue Stem Natives. We will hear from each of them in that order for about 10 minutes each and 10 to 15, and then we will take your questions. So while you're listening, if you do have a question, please write it in chat. Or if you want to ask in person, I'll introduce you to Vanessa per Peregrine, who's also here, um, another league member who will watch for your raised hand and call on you. Uh, you can either raise it in person like this or use the little raised hand icon on your screen and Vanessa will look for you. So with that, let's get started with John Belver. John is Community Outreach and Engagement Director at Holly Hill Farm on Jerusalem Road in Cohasset, where he's been working since 2004. He started the Farm to Food Pantry Program at the farm in 2012. A garden set, uh, it's a whole garden area set aside for growing food that's donated to three local food pantries, Wellsprings Aunt Dot's Kitchen and the food pantries in Cohasset and Situate. The program engages teens who are fulfilling community service requirements and adult volunteers too, who all work in the garden. They learn how food grows, develop an understanding of why growing food and eating organic food is better for our health and for the environment. And they also learn that food insecurity exists even right here in wealthy suburbs. So take it away, John. Thank you very much, Nina. And thank you, Vanessa, for alerting me to this opportunity to speak tonight with all of you. Uh, voters and um, listeners and uh, partakers. Uh, my name is John Belber and I'm very excited to, uh, to be here to think about what we, it is that we need to grow green and what, it is that, what is it that we want to grow. Very often when I'm in a garden with students, I'll, I'll go around and, and ask them what it is they'd like to grow in hopes of growing and then eating. And the, and the answers vary from watermelon to avocados to mangoes to bananas and some of which I have to quell uh, those ideas or divert them to a different climate growing season. Um, but there are many where we can try to engage their interests and uh, think about what it is that we are able to, to, to plant and grow. And then very often I work with what it is and how it is that we're going to grow. And since this is a growing green um, discussion tonight and the lovely colleagues who I'm getting to know here um, and, and have known um, practice responsible, um, thoughtful uh, planting practices, uh, it's really important that we respect the environment and work in ways that um, whatever it is we're growing 
can do so uh, in a healthy manner and in a um, and, and in a way that allows us to keep on doing this uh, for many many years. Um, I think first about the soil and the compost and the space we're growing. Today I was talking with some students about where is it that we're going to be able to do this growing. We can't really take up the the space in the ball field. We can't really um, dig into the driveway where the cars and the bicycles come rolling into school. We've got to find a, um, a space. It doesn't have to be large. It can be rather small. Um, it just needs to be a very mini little farm right there. It needs to be a little space that we can, we can designate for good, healthy soil. Um, we talk a lot about adding in compost. How important it is to add in compost? And I could spend the entire 12 and a half minutes talking about the importance of compost. And I'll just mention briefly how great it is to be able to divert food scraps and collect the manures from the animals on Holly Hill Farm and put that into the um, compost operations so we can then feed the soil and the plants that are growing, be it tomatoes or potatoes or kale or beets, are able to then pull uh, the nutrients that they need from that compost enriched soil. Compost holds on to the water. It's so important to retain that moisture. Um, considering that we might have droughts, we might have periods of, of no rain or heavy rains. We want a good, healthy soil to really um, help us with our growing, whatever it is we grow. And then I think back also to the fact that um, in the spaces that, that we're growing, either at Holly Hill Farm, where there are long uh, bed rows, 100, 200, 300 feet long, or there are community gardens that I've been involved in where the patches are 10 feet by 10 feet or 20 by 10 feet, or some gardeners I know in Quincy who are working off their balcony of their apartment and growing in a window box or in a few planters or pots. How we treat that soil and how we um, develop and enrich that soil is, is essential. And I think back to how Native Americans and indigenous people long before settlers came to this land to work on growing, had to find ways to enrich that soil. And the stories that we've heard of processing fish parts and working with um, different levels of, of compost to, to enrich the garden helped the growers in the 14, 15, 1600s and certainly helps the growers now. I'm thinking about what it is that we want to grow. And I've talked, um, mentioned to you already about how I ask kids and what is that you want to grow? Uh, you introduced Nina that there are many interested gardeners who are already probably more practiced than I. And there are many gardeners who may just be getting going or wishing to expand. Uh, we've welcomed volunteers like Vanessa and others uh, to the farm who are just trying to figure out what can, how can they use their backyard space? How can, they, how can they grow? How can they grow in season? What is it right now with the sun setting here to my right and the cool weather and thunderstorms predicted tonight and the increasing amount of daylight right now? What is it that we can grow right now? I would love to say, yes, put those tomatoes in and some wonderful um, peppers, maybe whose seeds you've saved or eggplants or other uh, basils or summer loving crops, we have to hold on and pause a moment because the New England weather right now around where we live, unless we have any viewers and League of Voters here from chiming in from different climate zones, um, most of the plants right now in the ground the farmers are growing and that we're trying to grow um, are sensitive to the weather. So peas and kale and broccoli and onions and lettuces and even some carrots and beets and radish. These are all plants to be transplanted into the ground or into a pot, or they're seeds um, to go directly into the ground. We're beginning to work the soil now. We're beginning to turn the soil over a little bit. We're not using a tractor at the farm. I don't suggest that you go out and, and buy a tractor for your backyard. I suggest that you add um, organic matter into your soil. There's lots of layering you can do, whether or not you have a horse who's providing manure or not. There's lots of leaves that often get sucked up in those giant leaf blowers um, or could be repurposed and regenerate the existing soil. 
Uh, in the fall, I go to the beach a lot and gather seaweed, which we try to incorporate into our beds. You get the idea that we're trying to enrich our gardens and to grow our, our soil. I mentioned compost, other ways that we can protect and um, uh, benefit that soil, provide beneficial um, organic matter to that soil is going to help whatever it is that we're trying to grow. And in season, as I mentioned, we have to pause on the tomatoes and the summer crops. This is a great time where these cool loving crops I mentioned can really get established and can really grow. And I think a lot about the in-season crops because of the fact in working with schools a lot and trying to get success for them, these kids. So many students and student and people are interested in quick, <laughs> quick growing, what's ready fast, when will the arugula be ready and, and how long do we have to wait? Well, many of these cool season crops are on the quicker side. And with the help of the farmers, I'm so fortunate to work and as I have for many years at Holly Hill with different farmers who each bring so much different um, perspectives of experience and who are growing in these heated hoop houses where uh, we now have propane heating on a cool, cool spring night. They're all starting these little seedlings, over 60,000, I think the farmers this year at Holly Hill are, are trying to get started. And um, we try to provide some workshops where people can figure out how they too can start their seeds and seedlings so they can be watched and observed and those teeny tiny roots can go down underground and the stems can come up and emerge, germinate out of the soil true leaves, little leaves first, the cotyledons, and then growing into more established plants who then can get adjusted and acclimated to the outdoors. This is a great time to welcome back all the perennials that are coming back. Some reliable um, crops that you might wanna start with are some hardy herbs, some terrific sage and oregano and chives and lavenders. Those are perennial herbs that are hardy strong in New England here who can come back each year and they're making a, a wonderful um, return as we uh, move through the springtime. And then as the days continue to get longer, we can continue to, um, to make sure that uh, certain plants are ready to come out and to be, to be grown um, fully outside. There's an old tale about no tomato shall be planted outside um, in the garden until after Memorial Day, because looking at the calendar, we may still have a frost date, we may still dip down below 32 degrees. Um, so we have to be mindful of that. The farmers are some of the best weather app readers I know um, who are able to find out, oh no, we cannot wait on that. Um, um, we have to wait on that plant. We cannot transplant that yet. We have to keep it in the greenhouse. Now, not all of us have the luxury of a greenhouse or two or three and the farmers at Holly Hill um, have worked hard to provide more greenhouses so we can do more year round growing and decide which plants can handle the shoulder seasons where it's cool and warm and cool and warm. So we are, we are constantly monitoring the weather and figuring out which crops can grow. Another point I'd like to make here as I watch my time is that, um, uh, what is the other point I want to make? The, the timing of, of these plants um, and the variety of these plants. So I mentioned the seasonality and if you're able to start some early spring crops, as I mentioned, the kale or radish or um, lettuces and they grow and come to their fruition and it's June and you're picking sugar snap peas or you're coming along and cutting your lettuce greens, then there's still time in June to maybe transplant something else and having that variety is good, I think, because variety is lovely. You have a diversity of crops. You get different things that you might like, different things that you can use and experiment in with your cooking. Uh, Nina introduced um, the fact that I uh, have been working on this farm to food pantry program, working with teens who learn about the seasonality of crops and realizing that um, a lot of that kale that's growing, yes, could go into a smoothie, but also could be uh, processed and worked with to um, make pesto. And have you ever had kale pesto before with garlic that's also been growing in your ground since last October? So we're trying to um, infuse some, some cooking ideas and getting people to think about all the different kinds of foods that are out there and what is able to really um, 
grow uh, within the season. So I'm watching my time. I saw a chat mentioned about comp about seaweed having to be composted. Certainly seaweed is a nitrogen based um, uh, crop that comes off uh, out of the ocean and onto the beaches and many towns will gladly welcome people to come haul off the backbreaking work of lifting seaweed off the beach. It doesn't need to be composted. I use it mostly as a mulch. It's a favorite um, mulch to put on uh, to the garlic planting that happens in October and November. And some other things I'd just like to close and, and mention is the shaking of a bean pod right here. So the farmers at Holly Hill are certified organic. They're selling their produce just about year round. There's a store.hollyhillfarm.org where they're selling online now due to COVID safety, wearing their masks and for a safe contact free um, delivery of their produce on Saturday mornings with a Thursday um, ordering. Uh, they have to really make sure and guarantee that all their seeds are organic, that they can grow their seeds and really make sure that they have good success for the fields and for whatever they're growing to sell with their produce at the Cohasset market or from their farm stand. I think it's important also, and the farmers are working on this, uh, to um, introduce and to continue more seed saving. So you see here, I'm shaking my um, seeds uh, because I know that there are good solid black beans in here that are marvelous for, um, I'll try to open for you, try to, try to use and incorporate, they'll need some soaking. You see those? Need some soaking before they're used for cooking, but it is possible to grow black beans around here. Um, as a resource, Holly Hill Farm is a resource. We're a teaching farm. Uh, I believe they'll attach um, my information here so I can reach out to you. I built a garden bed in Weymouth today for a woman who wanted to expand her garden slowly. I got some rough cut pine lumber from Williams Sawmill down in Carver. I cut that to size and I built a four foot by eight foot bed. She put some cardboard down to buffer against the grass, did this resident I was working with, Mary. Then she put some leaves she had gathered on top of the cardboard. And then I brought some soil, a nice loam and compost mix from JF Price. And part of what we, um, we do there was we try to help the gardeners. I mentioned how I'm teaching in schools Saw over 200 kids today working with them on lettuce seeds right into a, a grid of 32 square feet in a four by eight bed. We sowed directly sugar snap peas right, right in a row at about two inches apart. Now's the time to do that. They'll hopefully come to fruition before school is out in late June. Yes, I'm sure seaweed would be wonderful for blueberries. I saw that on the chat come across. I'm mindful of my time. I'm mindful of the fact that it's lovely to be invited here to talk about growing, about a diversity of seeds and plants and crops, and to be able to um, be a resource, a teaching resource here, where I'm continually learning, continually learning from the farmers, and I'm happy and excited to share that learning with new and familiar and seasoned gardeners. So thanks for having me on today, and I look forward to listening to Kristen and wonderful Blue Stem and Todd. Thank you, John. And I'm sure there will be more questions coming. Um, everybody, we can just put the questions in the chat and we'll ask, um, you were great, John, to kind of watch and ask and answer as they came along, but, um, but we can certainly wait till the end to ask questions all at once for anybody else if you don't want to monitor the chats. Um, all right, so next I'd like to introduce Todd Breitenstein. Um, of Norwell. Todd is the man behind the Grateful Garden, where among many other subjects, they fo focus on healthy yards, uh, rounding the edges, using organic practices for healthy yards, and how to transition from chemicals for a healthy lawn and landscape. Todd's a lifelong gardener, a nature lover, and NOFA, that's Northeast Organic Farming Association, accredited organic land care professional. So Todd, you're on. Thank you. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, great job, Johnny. I love, I always love hearing you talk, um, especially when the kids come home and say they were with Johnny. It always makes me happy. Um, so rounding the edges, I kind of want to just, you know, 10 minutes, 12 minutes isn't really, 
a tremendous amount of time to get into anything that in depth. So I just kind of want to give you some key points on lawn care, uh, where we're trying to do things greener. Um, you know, obviously a lawn is not necessarily the greenest thing we can do from a pollution standpoint, from a chemical standpoint, and from a water usage standpoint. Um, and there are ways to um, manage that. Obviously, technology has taken us in wonderful directions with battery and robotic powered lawn mowers, um, which can reduce the emission. Um, you'll see that at, at some point in the next decade, I would suggest that almost all the lawn guys out there are going to be using battery powered um, as commercial grade uh, battery equipment comes across, um, but you can certainly ask them to use battery powered weed trimmers and blowers. There's a ton of them on the market that are really effective. So that could be a good way for you guys to be involved. Um, right now, tons of people want to know what's going on with their lawn. It's not browning up or uh, greening up. It's brown in big patches. Um, and, you know, we all end up with grubs. Um, it happens unless you're um, treating so I just want to kind of cover some organic methods for some pests, some organic methods for, um, you know, fertilization. Um, Johnny mentioned compost. You can't go wrong with compost anywhere in your yard. Um, but a lot of what we see in landscaping is, is what we do because um, that's what we've seen before. Um, landscapers particularly aren't horticulturist for the most part. Um, they're just kind of doing what they've seen done before. Um, you might have noticed large piles of um, mulch around the bases of trees. Um, that's something that we've all seen and all I think is what's the right thing to do because that's what we've seen before um, and it couldn't be further from the truth. And that's just one tip of the iceberg um, of what's going on on landscapes um, where, where we're not necessarily doing the right thing um, just because we've seen it practiced that way before. Um, so aerating your lawn in the springtime, for instance, you know, people are asking to have their lawn done. So you might be offered an aeration. Um, aeration stirs up lots of weed seeds. Um, so if you were gonna do a lawn right now in the spring, you would wanna slice seed it uh, because it doesn't stir up a bunch of seeds. Um, and you would, want to add compost to the top of that lawn to be able to provide some nutrients. Um, the thing with lawns is that um, they are preferring um, to be moist and they are preferring temperatures to be in the 70s. Uh, believe it or not, most lawns want to go dormant once the temperatures go over 70. Um, and we fight that. Uh, we fight that through applying chemicals and by applying water. Um, water is the most crucial component of making any lawn grow. Um, you can get most any type of lawn seed to grow in pretty poor soil um, as long as you water it. Um, and, and you're going you know, to be offered a lot of different opportunities to fertilize a lawn. Um, in most instances, um, the, the lawn can sustain itself um, if, if there's biology present. And I'm going to do a really brief soil explanation um, so that way you guys get it. In the soil, um, there's air, there's water, there's organic matter, and there's biology. And the most important thing is the biology. Um, there's fungus, and there's bacteria, and there's insects, and there's worms, um, and they're all working together. The problem is with a lawn is that we put all of that under a ton of stress because it gets compacted from our foot traffic. Um, it gets dead from herbicides and pesticides that are applied to it. Um, and it also gets stressed out a ton from the summer sun and watering. Um, so if you were to pay attention to what's going on in the soil, you'd come to find out that there's indicators in your lawn that show what's going on with the soil. So like a great example of that would be moss. Um, a mossy lawn is indicative of compacted soil and highly acidic soil. Um, Massachusetts, we all have acidic lawn uh, soil. It's just part of what happens in our climate that we get acid in our soils and then um, so we treat it with lime and lime is, you know, obviously something. So if you're going to redo your lawn, you want to, you know, find out what's in the soil. 
Um, and I'm not talking about a fancy soil test. I'm talking about digging a hole and getting a shovel and like looking what's there and seeing is it is it dark and rich and smells real good or is it really sandy? Um, did you find any worms? What's in the soil? Um, starting with, um, you know, looking at what's in the soil just by an eye test can give you a great indication of what's there. Um, so once you figure out, you know, what kind of soil you have, it might be a good idea to say, all right, wait, this is all sand. This isn't going to work. Or wait, well, this is really clay and we're not going to be able to grow things. That's when you're going to need to address things really from a much larger perspective. But for most of us, it really is just a matter of following a couple of key things. If you really want lawn, you need to water it. And that means you need to water it at least an inch a week. Um, and you need to do a couple things. You need to aerate in the fall. You have to aerate it because the compaction really doesn't help the, the grass get good strong roots. So if you aerate in the fall and top dress with compost and reseed it, you, you'll have success. Water, aerate in the fall, top dress and compost. If you don't do those three things, you're not really gonna have a lawn. Um, and I'm okay with that, um, honestly. The more different types of plants you can get into your lawn, the better. It's going to be, you know, what I like to call a freedom lawn, anything that's free to grow under the mower blades. Um, and the more things that you can put in there, the better you are going to be. This is a diversity of plants. It's really interesting to think about it. But if you have all one type of plant, it's going to be more susceptible to um, an infestation of, of a pest. Um, you can have tons of different plants and then you're going to have um, tons of different insects that are coming and it'll all kind of stay in balance. Um, so the best things for lawns in Massachusetts, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, are um, fescues, crabgrass, and clover. Um, they kind of all work together very well. Um, your fescues are green in the spring when it's cool. Um, the clover um, will help fix nitrogen and stay green. Um, and feed the crabgrass that's gonna come in when the, the heat's on and everything else is dormant. The crabgrass is very tolerant of the heat. Um, there are lots of different alternative things going on right now, which is really cool. I love seeing people talking about uh, wild strawberry, um, you know, and self-heal. It's two great lawn plants that you can get going by seed. Um, they're really popular, same with buffalo grass. Um, those are three that'll work in the sun. And then if you have shade, uh, Pennsylvania sedge is also a good lawn alternative that you could do. Um, but really, if you could focus on just getting fescues, if you really want that turf type grass, um, transitioning from the blue grasses and the rye to the fescue, they use less water, they're more drought tolerant. Um, and so they can, you know, you can be more successful. Um, for pests, milky spore is an organic alternative. Milky spore works great for um, controlling grubs. It is bio a biological control. It takes a couple of seasons to get it to work. Um, so if you apply it in the spring and then in the fall, in the following spring, you're gonna get a buildup of it in the lawn that when the Japanese beetles lay their eggs and the grubs try and take the soil as they move through it, it like rips the the milky spore goes in and kind of like eats them from the inside out. Um, so that's really good for grubs. Um, dandelions, are they good or bad? That just depends on who's telling you. Um, that's terrific. I love dandelions. I eat them all the time. You just have to be careful where you um, eat them from. The oldest medicinal plant that's ever been used is the dandelion. Um, that got demonized through certain corporate um, interests that wanted to sell a certain chemical product that would work against them. Um, so uh, what else here? Let's see. Um, the fescues are really big. Um, compost, Johnny said it, the biology, 90%, um, oh, I kind of lost track on the, on the biology part. 90% of all plants have formed a symbiotic relationship with the um, biology in the soil and the fungus and the um, bacteria. Um, like 
70% of what a plant is doing is root building. Um, and there's two things that they're doing with the roots. One, the roots are going to hold the plant in place. They're also going to use those roots to bring up nutrients to the plants, but it's also a exchange. They, they're paying a tax to the soil through exudates. They have to excrete um, sugars and carbons out of their roots in exchange with the bacteria and the fungi that are helping them bring up the minerals. Um, people will see that with um, clover is like, do I need to inoculate before I throw out this, the clover seed? Because you want certain types of bacteria to be present that will work with the clover to fix the nitrogen. Um, so digging up grubs, I mean, if you have something to do with them, dig them up. If you have time, dig up the grubs. Chickens love them. As long as you're not treating your lawn with anything, um, dig up the grubs. That's a great idea. Um, I've done a lot of that. I dig up dandelions um, because my neighbors aren't really going to be um, digging up dandelions. And you know how many seeds are on the top of a dandelion? Like, it's crazy. So. Um, I just kind of twist it and leave the roots and they come back, but at least I know that um, the seeds aren't spreading because I don't want to put pressure on my neighbors to do things that they would do to get rid of the dandelions. Um, yeah, I don't know, how, how am I doing for time here? That looks good, Todd. Okay. <laughs> um, All right. Yeah, we're good. And so, and I know that again, um, there will there are definitely some other questions we'll get to that I'll ask you from here later. Okay. Can um, I just add one real quick sure. thing with with fertilizing a lawn is that it really takes way less than what the packages say um, if you mulch your lawn. If you're willing to use the mulching blade on a lawnmower, those clippings provide enough nitrogen to get rid of um, a whole entire application of a nitrogen that a package would recommend. And wow. then also your lawn is dormant in the summer. So if you're not watering it, it's dormant. You don't need to fertilize then either. So that's two. So just by using a mulching blade and by not fertilizing when the lawn is dormant, cause it's actually not gonna use it because it's dormant. Um, you've just saved yourself two applications out of what usually is said you should do four. So okay, that's a great way to reduce. Wow. Um, actually, I am going to ask you a question right now because I just wanted a clarification on a word. You said that, um, air because it, it's related to the same thing, aeration stirs up the weed seeds. But so what did you say to do instead? Slice? Oh, to slice seed, seed yes. What's that? Slice, like slice of bread. Oh. It's a machine that has these discs and they slice. And as they slice, they put seeds into the slices. So that way it covers back up. Weed seeds last forever in the soil. So when you take an aerator, which takes those core, the plugs out and toss it up onto the top of the lawn, right at the spring side, springtime, when the conditions are perfect, they'll erupt versus in the fall, it's cooler. Things are starting to go into dormancy. You're gonna get less of that weed overtake from aerating. Um, but aerating and top dressing with compost and then reseeding uh, once a year. The best lawns I've ever seen were always maintained that way with very minimal chemical input. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, let's hear from Kristen Nicholson next. Um, Kristen's one of the three women founders of Blue Stem Natives. It's a plant, native plant nursery located in Norwell. Kristen's passionate about all things native plant, eco-friendly, and environmentally sustainable. Blue Stem's main goal is to increase accessibility to, to and education about native plants to the general public, believing that you shouldn't have to be a scientist to turn your yard into a wildlife-friendly oasis. Sounds good to me. All right, Kristen, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. All right, so I have a couple of very easy slides tonight. Um, so everyone, thanks for having me tonight. Um, like you said, our passion is making native plants accessible uh, to the everyday gardener. Uh, we've noticed that that's increasingly difficult to find the native plants that we want to put in our gardens. 
Um, and we've heard all about the benefits of using organic practices for growing food for our families and taking care of our lawns. Um, so I wanted to talk tonight about how we can use native plants in our landscape and how those can benefit us as well. Uh, so what are native plants anyways? They are defined as those which have evolved over time through interaction with local soils, climate, fauna, and other plants without human interaction or cultivation. And in North America, that includes plants that were here before European settlers. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to native plants, gardening zones don't really apply. It's not like um, Johnny was talking about with vegetables. It's like you have gardening zones where in six, I'm in six A, um, you might be something different when you're on the coast. Um, so gardening zones don't really apply with native plants. We tend to focus more on eco regions, which means choosing plants that are native to the specific geographical location where you're planting. So basically you would choose plants that are native to New England uh, rather than those that are neighbor, native to like, Oregon, somewhere across the country. Even if you're in the same gardening zone um, as those two places, two very, very, very different places when it comes to natives. So why choose native plants? Um, you can see we have quite the list. They are water wise. They eliminate the need for herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers. They restore habitat for a variety of wildlife. They improve genetic diversity and they bring back the bugs. So a quick word on the bugs, don't freak out. Everybody freaks out. Um, a healthy ecosystem has checks and balances. So if you have an issue, if you have a swarm, if you have a lot of mosquitoes, you have to check to see what's lacking in your yard. What's creating that problem? Do you have standing water? Do you have a lack of birds, a lack of bats? And all of these problems can be solved using native plants. So you take the native plants needs and use them to solve your problems. So how many of us uh, love hummingbirds? and we put out nectar feeders. Um, well, the hummingbird only uses about 10% of its caloric intake is from nectar. Um, and 90% is through insects. So a tiny little hummingbird can consume anywhere from a few dozen to a few thousand insects every day. And the bugs are important. And how many people put out bird seed feeders? Um, adult birds, eat the bird seed, which is great for them, but baby birds can't eat seeds. They eat squishy things like caterpillars. So chickadees, uh, the adults weigh less than half an ounce, but in order to feed a brood of their hatchlings, they need to feed them approximately six to 9,000 caterpillars within a two week period. Um, so that's an incredible amount of caterpillars. Caterpillars are found on native plants. So we are already in a statewide serious drought. This is a current picture of the drought conditions in Massachusetts. We are located in that orange section, which is a level two significant drought. And I think that's gonna be getting worse shortly, sorry to say. Um, and every summer we have water restrictions that keep us from growing the gardens that we would really love to grow. And we just constantly using more and more water to keep them flourishing. Well, native plants often have very deep root systems and they're far deeper than the turf grasses and non-native ornamentals um, that we have. So you can see in this slide that the non-natives are on the left with the natives on the right. And the root systems are vastly different. That little spot in the center there is, oh, sorry, Todd, it says fescue. That's from a different spot. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the root system is way shorter. So we are constantly having to water and water and water and water. And Todd nailed it when he said, you know, these grasses are cool season grasses. They go dormant when we want them to be nice and, and pretty and green. Um, so we're constantly fighting nature every step of the way. 
but these um, native plants have these incredibly deep root systems. Not all of them, most of them have these incredibly deep root systems. So they get the water from deep within the water table. Um, so you don't need to surface water nearly as often. In fact, most of the plants that require um, drier soils will not do well if you have them in a wetter spot. So they do need regular watering when they're first planted, um, but once they're established, most natives can withstand prolonged drought without excessive dieback. So with the herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizer, we've already covered the bugs and why it's important um, to have native plants for bugs, but you can stop using the dangerous chemicals on your lawn. When planted in their proper locations, native plants can help compete against invasive non-native species and they reduce or eliminate most herbicides. So you won't need to buy weed and feed again. And native plants have evolved in our New England soil, that sandy, rocky soil that Todd mentioned. Um, and they contain, Todd used all my talking points <laughs> with those microbes in the soil that are so important. Um, a lot of our native plants have grown with those microbes over many, 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 many generations um, and they benefit each other. So they need those microbes in the soil. When you're buying bags of topsoil from Home Depot, you're not necessarily getting those microbes that the native plants need. Along with that, native plants often repair and regenerate the soil that you put them into. So if you have some native plants um, in a garden that it's, I mean, it's just stripped down, but these native plants do well there. Most of the time, those plants will be uh, fixing nitrogen, repairing the soil, adding organic matter to that soil and preparing that for other plants to come in over time and grow where they wouldn't have before. So you now have different layers. The older plants will die away, the newer plants will grow and it just keeps continuing. Uh, as far as compost, compost works uh, for native plants too, we highly recommend the use of leaf mulch, um, whole leaf mulch and compost down. For native plants, I'll call them ornamentals, perennials um, and such, you don't typically need to add compost to the soil. We recommend doing top dressings if you need to use as a mulch, um, because again, native plants typically uh, do well just fine in the poorer soils really. So you could add a little bit of compost, but it's not usually necessary with the native plants. Native plants, probably most importantly, provide a diverse habitat for a wide variety of wildlife, including native birds, butterflies, bees, and other organisms, um, many of which are specialists, which means they're only able to feed on a single species of plant. And the monarch butterfly is one of the most well-known specialists. So when an insect is a specialist, it means it has evolved and developed alongside one or a few specific species of plants in an area. And they're only able to gain vital nutrition from that one species of plant. The monarch butterfly is a species specialist for Asclepia species, commonly known in, as the milkweed family. The adult monarch will lay its eggs on the milkweed, and when the larvae hatch, the caterpillars will only be able to feed on the milkweed leaves. And monarch caterpillars have also developed a protection against the toxic milky white sap of the milkweed plants, um, and they've developed that over thousands of generations. So milkweed used to be found in great swaths all over the country. Um, and once it was deemed weedy, just like the dandelions, it was mowed down. Um, people stopped letting it grow along roadsides. It just essentially became a weed and nobody wanted it. Unfortunately, because of that, the monarch population is now down to around 10% and is most definitely facing extinction in the coming years. So a quick side note, 
The type of milkweed matters. You wanna plant according to the ecotype. Tropical milkweed belongs in tropical locations. If you plant it up north, it confuses the monarchs and it disrupts their migration. So while we're on the topic of choosing one type of plant over another, I will talk briefly about cultivars. Um, a cultivar is a cultivated variety. And that just means that a human being saw something, uh, you saw a pretty plant and decided they wanted more of that plant. And instead of growing from seed and um, kind of leaving it up to nature, they cultivate that plant and they, they do clonal propagation. So they're splitting, dividing, taking tissue cultures. Um, so you are getting, when you have a cultivar, you are getting an exact clone of the original plant. And why is that not great? That's not great. So why is that not great? Um, so uh, biodiversity is a very good thing. Everybody will agree with that. It's good in humans, it's good in the workplace, it's good in schools, it's good in nature too. Um, and when you are clonally propagating plants, you are removing biodiversity from the area. So how do you tell that you have a cultivar? If you look at the screen, um, this is just an illustration of a plant tag that you might see at a garden center. You have the scientific name at the top and don't be afraid of trying to pronounce the Latin names because we like to have fun with those. That middle line with the single quotations here, that is the cultivar name. It's often a little fanciful or a little descriptive. Um, and then underneath that, you might have the common name. So whenever you see that single quotation um, in italics, you know that you have a cultivar. You can know that that plant is a clonal propagated plant. So it's an exact clone of the, the original plant. Um, so you are choosing to put that plant in your garden and you are reducing genetic diversity. And you can't really, um, I mean, you can, you can divide plants that are cultivars, but you can't really save seeds. Most of them are sterile to begin with. And if you were to take seeds from a cultivar plant, and try to grow them out in the future, the plant's gonna revert back to some variety um, back in its generations before. So you'll never really get exactly that same plant again. So stay away from cultivars if you can help it. When it comes to garden design, there's a saying in the native plant world, right plant, right place. Um, many would say that applies to any type of plant but it's especially important when it comes to natives. You might want to put that blue lobelia in a very sunny front yard, um, but it really won't grow as well as it would if it were in a slightly shady, wet place in your backyard. So you wanna be thoughtful when it comes to selecting native plants. You wanna look at each space that you have with the same questions in mind. What are the soil conditions? Is it sandy, loamy, or, or clay? How much sun does the area get? Is it sunny or shady different times a day? How much water does the area receive? Is it often dry or do puddles form? And once you have these important facts down, you can start designing your garden beds. So I made a quick list of some um, great plants that can work well in, in this whole area. Um, Todd stole some of mine, so I'll be repeating a little bit of his. But we're lucky to live in a place that has a lot of trees. Um, but if you're looking to plant one or a few, you wanna try to choose according to the most ecologically valuable. So these trees have been chosen because they support so many insects. Um, Doug Tallamy, Dr. Tallamy, um, loves to say that if you have an insect problem, take five steps backwards and all your problems disappear. So our favorites of the trees are the oak and the oak trees support over 500 different species of insects 
which is incredible. You'd never know it just looking at these beautiful oak trees, but they do. And they're all important for very different reasons. Um, you don't like the idea of caterpillars and, and things eating up your oak leaves, but those caterpillars are feeding those beautiful little chickadees that we love so much. And if a chickadee can go to one oak tree and find a few thousand caterpillars, then we're making their job easier. Uh, we also have cherries. So black cherry is a particular favorite around here. Um, we have a variety of native willows that work well. And we also have birch trees. And if you're looking for shrubs to replace some vases like Rose of Sharon and Burning Bush, um, we have a few favorites. New Jersey tea, so you know this Americanus is, an, is a great plant. Um, it only grows to about three feet tall, so it works very well in sunny front yards uh, up against foundations. Uh, the viburnum, which is our native uh, American cranberry bush, which is viburnum trilobum. Also our blueberry, Vaccinium corumbusum. Both of those have amazing fall color. They both turn beautiful shades of red, burgundy, and yellow. Uh, we love service berry. It's one of our favorites. It's an early bloomer, which makes it fantastic for our early pollinators. And we also love witch hazel, which has uh, multi-seasonal visual interests as well. I think witch hazel is phenomenal with all the little craggy stems everywhere. Um, rhododendron and azaleas are native here too, but remember to stick with the straight species and avoid the cultivars uh, for, to be more ecologically friendly. These are a few of our pollinator powerhouse plants. They're specially chosen because they support our at-risk bumblebees. Most people don't realize that there are more species, um, more than one species of bumblebees. And our at-risk ones are called Bombus fervidus and Bombus vagans. These plants are specially chosen to help support them because they bloom at different times, which is very important. Top of our list is the giant purple hyssop, Agastache scrofularia folia. Just gotta practice those. Um, we also love showy goldenrod, Solidago speciosa. My personal favorite, one of my favorites is bee balm. It's like choosing a child. Um, Monarda fistulosa. Someone mentioned in a presentation I gave the other day that they would love to plant this in a container gardener, garden. And I think that's a great idea. Uh, foxglove beer tongue, Penstemon digitalis, and all of our milkweeds. We have quite a few native milkweeds uh, to choose from. And here's where Todd beat me to the punch. <laughs> our favorite ground covers and lawn replacements. Uh, Pennsylvania sedge is one of our very favorites, uh, Carex pensylvanica. It is a, a moderately tall growing sedge, you know, eight to 12 inches tall. You can mow it once a year, twice a year if you want to, or you can let it grow and it will only grow so high. It'll flop over. It'll be very pretty. Um, and it supports a lot of pollinators um, and doesn't take nearly the amount of work that a green lawn would. Wild strawberry is another favorite of ours, Fragaria virginiana. Uh, this does produce edible berries, very teeny tiny ones. Um, you'll have to be very quick in order to find them because most of the birds and small mammals will get them before you do. Plantain pussy toes is a blue stem. Uh, it has, we sh I think we should have called it Antonaria instead of blue stem. We're growing so many of them. Antonaria plagenifolia. Ooh, plagena. Yep. I messed that one up. <laughs> um, this one, it's so adorable. It grows, it's super cute. Um, and one of our many native violets, bird's foot violet, which is Viola pida. Um, they are all very important when it comes to serving those early pollinators um, that are just waking up in the spring. These cover the ground, they grow very low, right under your mower blades and um, they do a great job. So we at Blueston Natives, just a quick little plug, 
we've found that people um, get a little overwhelmed when it comes to planting garden spaces. So we've designed kits to help take some of that edge off. And we have kits uh, specially designed for those at-risk bumblebees, uh, for sun and shade gardens, for monarch gardens, um, and a bunch of others. So if you can find kits in different places, um, I believe the Monarch Gardener up in Ipswich is offering them this year as well. Um, they can help you set up a garden area fairly quickly. And I compiled a quick list of information. Um, there's so much information out there that if you really wanna do a, a deep dive into things, there's so much to learn. Um, of course, bluestemnatives.com, my partner, Britt and Jasmine have done a phenomenal job uh, building out their website and just putting in, we're, we're packing it with information. Um, and we've learned just as much as we're writing everything. Um, nativeplanttrust.org is phenomenal as well. The monarchgardener.com. Uh, if everything you've ever wanted to know about monarchs, she knows it. The caterpillarlab.org. Um, Sam Jaffe is amazing and he has the best pictures. NWF.org. Um, that's the National, National Wildlife Federation. You can search on there for native plants uh, according to your um, zip code. And it will tell you how many um, insects you're supporting with the plant choices. And then you have homegrownnationalpark.org, which is a Doug Tallamy's um, latest venture, trying to see if we can map out across the country how many people are planting native plants in their backyards. And that's all I have for tonight, it's short and sweet. Thank you, Kristen. I'm trying to get myself back here. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a huge amount of information. Um, so at this point, uh, I think we should turn to some questions. There definitely have been, um, there have been some in the chat that have been answered as we go. Um, I'd like to bring one that uh, kind of combines a couple of you guys. Well, first of all, I, I'm wondering, well, okay, first of all, someone said that mulch was, uh, that we don't want mulch. Um, you know, that I think you were talking about not having mulch around the trees, et cetera, et cetera, mulch as we generally know it. Um, but I'm wondering what would you use instead? And is that where some of these native ground covers come in? Um, like for underplanting, under things like rhododendrons or whatever, what do you do to keep the weeds down other than weed? Now I'll start with that one. Um, so leaf litter is always probably your best bet. You start, you really can't go wrong if you take what's already falling in your yard and using it in your yard. You don't have to bring anything in from the outside, you know what's going on already. So leaf litter is great. You don't have to chop it up or anything, just push it under there. Um, and you can use living mulches. So again, things that grow a little uh, quicker, usually by rhizomes or, or stolons. Um, like the wild strawberry makes a great living mulch. I like to plant those um, underneath bigger shrubs and whatnot. Um, so they'll cover the ground. It is always good to leave a little bit of bare ground around your yard as well, because we have quite a few ground nesting bees. Mm. And I don't say that to freak people out either. Most of our bees are solitary bees and they don't, um, you know, come out in and attack you. If, um, so don't get freaked out by that. But so you want to leave a little bit of bare ground. Bare ground is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but using the leaves and some quickly spreading natives, you know, low growing natives will help too. Okay. And then related to that, there was a question about clover. I know a lot of people, you know, today we heard about lots of alternatives to clover for a yard, which is great. Um, but the, I think some of the people are concerned about clover with bees too, you know, if you are allergic to bees, um, is it a good idea to have clover on your yard? Only if you walk barefoot. Okay. <laughs> so are bees a problem with clover? Uh, 
I haven't really seen it as a problem, but bees do love clover. I mean, they do. Okay. My daughter is actually allergic to bees and we've never had her stung like by a bee on the lawn. It's usually like yellow jackets and things that get angry. But most of our bees are from the soil. Like they actually live in dusty roads and open dirt areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one of the questions said it. Um, she would like to add clover to her lawn, but she's laid down seed for the past two years and no luck. She doesn't use anything except loam and lime. Is there and a... The clover seed's not germinating. Is that what the question is? Sounds like it. That's tricky. That could be a lot of things. Bad seed, improper watering, not covering it enough. You kind of got to rake it in. Okay. That could be the seed. <laughs> I'm going with the seed on that one. <laughs> All right, Vanessa, do you have anyone who has a, um, a hand up? Uh, not currently. However, I actually have a bunch of questions myself. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, go into this. Uh, for example, are there any native plants that might be helpful in controlling tick or mosquito populations in an ecosystem like that might encourage uh, things that will eat them? So. And is the question of the season. Everybody's asking that. Um, so short answer is no, actually. <laughs> Unfortunately, ticks are really just a part of our ecosystem and we have to learn to live with them. Um, and as much as I do, I, I don't use pesticides in our yard. Um, there are certain things that you can do to reduce harm from ticks um, on your own self. So um, we use things like permethrin in our clothing when we're gonna be working out in the yard. It's perfectly safe for humans. Um, there are some issues with cats. So if you have cats, you don't wanna be using it around them. Um, personally, I use um, a cedar oil product on my own clothes because they do have cats. Um, and I have found that that works really well I don't spray it in my yard. You'll find companies that recommend you do that. I do not do that um, because even though they do say that it doesn't harm pollinators, it does. It's not discriminate. It doesn't just pick out ticks and kill the ticks. Um, but basically, we, it's a lot of human responsibility. If you're going to be walking through tall grasses, make sure you're wearing the proper clothing. Make sure you're checking for ticks very, very well and very shortly after you leave that area, um, treat your clothing. I like to keep a lint roller in my car. Um, so when I come back from the woods, I do a quick lint roll um, and it catches a lot of the ticks before they get a chance to get underneath my clothes. Um, and if you, the ideally, if, if you're building a wildlife habitat, you're encouraging animals like foxes, which will eat rodents, which are the main driver of um, Lyme disease with the deer ticks. Um, and also a lot of people don't like this, but if you encourage snakes in your yard, they do the same thing. So you're encouraging other wildlife to kind of maintain that population for you. Um, and you should see a bit of a decrease, but you have to live with those other ones too. And I just, I want to add one thing to that. And that's really brilliant about attracting the right animals that would help with the rodent population, but also thinking in terms of what you're planting. Um, hedgerows, things like um, barberry, multiflora rose, things like that, they're great habitat for the mice. So if there's a place for them to escape to, to run and hide, that or a stone wall, those are places where you're going to more frequently come in contact with that proximity to the rodents where the ticks would be. So then checking yourself after you're next to that or trying to go away from hedge type things in your landscaping. Vanessa, do you have another? I sure do. <laughs> I'm actually, uh, for the, the ground covers that you were talking about before, like the wild strawberries and that sort of thing, can that be mowed? I know obviously it can be stepped on, but is that like, can you mow wild strawberries and that kind of stuff or? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, ideally, from an ecological standpoint, you'd want to wait until after they go to seed. Um, wild strawberries, not so much because they spread by runner, but if you have short little ground covers that you're trying to fill your lawn with, you wanna let them flower and then go to seed and then mow them because if you mow them while the flowers are still visible, um, they're not gonna reseed themselves. So you're gonna have to constantly be filling your lawn. It's just gonna add a lot of work. But if you let the flowers do the work for you and let them spread their own seed, then next year you'll just have a stronger, thicker wildlife uh, garden there. If you mow, if you mow Carex pennsylvanicum, the Pennsylvania sedge below four inches, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be happy. You do need to allow it to have some at least four inches to, to maintain itself. You can't really scalp it down like a regular lawn and expect it to make it. It won't be happy with that. Right. Okay. Um, there is a question about, uh, here, I have poor and very little soil over ledge and most of the area for growing uh, gets partial shade. Any tips for containers or raised bed gardens in that situation? I'm assuming that's what I'd need to do. I especially would love to grow vegetables or herbs. Well, anything that you can to enrich the soil uh, would be great to improve that soil. You see you have poor soil. So uh, obviously trying to make that better would be good. Um, uh, we mentioned shade. Now in springtime, when the leaves are just beginning to to, to leaf out, so to speak. Um, there's still time to put some shade loving crops like lettuces in and directly seeding some arugula or a little late for spinach. But um, some of those leafy greens uh, can, can go in now. Um, they're less demanding for, for the sun. Um, I mentioned perennial herbs earlier. Those are really terrific because um, uh, they're, they're usable, they're not dependent, I don't think, on full sun. Um, and maybe that's close to the close to the home where you can can monitor them and as well as enrich those soil in the pots or containers. I have a question about the um, container gardening also for vegetables. Um, I had read, first of all, I haven't heard a lot these days about companion gardening. It used to be when I first did vegetable gardening ages and ages ago, it was all about companion gardening. And I was trying to refresh my memory of what goes with what and what you should put together. And I actually couldn't find a lot. So why <laughs> is that still something I should be concerned about? Um, well, it is, um... It's terrific to consider. There's a book, Carrots Love Tomatoes. I think it talks a lot about companion gardening. Um, we only had 12 minutes each, you know, so we couldn't cover oh, everything. That's why I'm asking you the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what comes to mind um, right off the bat are um, how the farmers are interplanting right now. Um, you can put um, kale or chard down a garden bed and put radish along the side. That's a nice little simple example of companion planting. Um, I'd be so bold as to say with Jasmine last year, we had a vegetable garden at a school and we devoted one bed to, to native seedlings. So uh, that's not quite the same garden bed, but it's the same area where you can then maybe welcome uh, different uh, insects and, and things to the garden just by having uh, your vegetables near to your flowers or your pollinators as well as your native seedlings. Mm -hmm. but there are many different combinations depending on root space and where the plants traject up or out or runners, as you said, Kristen, earlier with strawberries. So you really should get a book. Well, that's, yeah. <laughs> the Farmer's Almanac always does a pretty good companion planting guide. I think actually I learned about native plants. I actually kind of came to native plants through companion planting because what I saw in my vegetable garden was things like hyssop and um, aromatic flowers interplanted with my typical plants just had a tremendous impact on the pest pressure that I was getting. Um, and that's when I kind of started geeking out on like learning about native plants. And I was like, wow, like there's this whole other thing that actually applies to your landscape at home. It's called nature and it works. <laughs> no fighter. <laughs> I know, right? 
Well, and one other thing about that I was reading about in container, you know, in um, raised beds that are not huge. Do you, the next year, should you not plant the same crop in the same spot? Should you really rotate based on the soil? I mean, ideally, I think, Todd, would you agree? And it's from, hard to, it's hard to rotate. Things. Yeah. Okay. And it's hard to rotate native seedlings if they're perennial <laughs> or native yeah. plants. But tomatoes, uh, tomatoes don't mind growing in the same place year after year. Okay. A lot of the rotation has to do with pests too. Yeah. It's because if you grow something in the same spot then they lay their eggs in the soil and they come right out. Um, vine borers are the classic. Um, they come out early spring. So if you plant summer squash in the early spring, when the weather's warm, the vine borers come out and gobble it all up. But if you wait until July, August and plant your summer squash, you have way less pressure from the vine borers because they've already life cycled through there. But if you don't move them from area to area, I don't know about that. In your yard, the vine borers are gonna find it. They'll figure it out. They can travel. Um, on a on a on a farm level, I think crop rotation probably makes a lot of sense. In your yard, uh, you're gonna you're gonna really need to do a lot of investigation yourself, especially on your vegetable plants. That's why I always recommend watering at the base of your plants with a handheld watering hose because it gives you the opportunity to get into the garden and see what's in there. It gives you that time to inspect for weeds, for pests, for to see, but that also forces you to enjoy your garden. You're putting all this work into it, you know, enjoy it while you water it. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Do we How much time do you got? <laughs> <laughs> we can go all night. <laughs> I can talk about vegetable gardening with John for until the cows come home. Well, and I think a lot depends on the soil um, in terms of the rotation piece. If you're really taking care of your soil, you're putting those leaves down, as Kristen said, in the fall, you're sourcing any other organic matter to add to it. You, you, you don't have to rely on that crop rotation. You can really okay. care for that precious, ever disappearing soil. Yeah. All right, here's a question. How deep is the root system of the wild strawberry and will it interfere with the septic field? I saw my partner Britt answered that in the chat, but um, wild strawberries tend to spread by runners. Um, they form a mat, you know, so their roots aren't very deep. So we always recommend checking first with your septic company, um, especially the ones that install it if you can, or the ones that service it, because septic systems are pretty shallow. Um, so they'd be the first ones to ask, but we do like wild strawberry is great. Uh, again, that Pennsylvania sedge can work well because even though it has that grass-like appearance, it has, um, you know, a decently shallow root system. Um, but check with your septic company. We will not be held responsible <laughs> for anything you plant over a septic field. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> All right. Well, as long as no one has a hand up. Do you see anybody? No hands, although I do have one last thing. Um, so it, it, obviously encouraging uh, plants to kind of grow, uh, things that we think of as weeds to kind of grow uh, naturally is better to have a, a better ecosystem. But what, to, what do we do about uh, invasive species that are clearly gonna outcompete things that are native? Is that likely to, like, should we be more vigilant about that or assume that it'll balance out or? Which yeah, absolutely. Like invasive species are invasive because they do not have any natural predators here. Um, so if you just let the invasive species go, they'll keep going. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures from down south of Kudzo. It, it's carpeting everything, like it's taking over. Um, and up here we have bittersweet. We have the Japanese knotwood. It's horrible. I'm not weed. It's horrible. Um, so really you have to do the work to remove the invasive species, things like garlic mustard, the seeds can last in the soil for I'm seeing up to 10 years or, you know, possibly more. Um, and a lot of these species change the composition of the soil, the chemical in the soil. So they are preventing other 
plants from growing, that they have a chemical in their root systems that are changing the soil. So if you are hoping that the native plants will do the work for you, you're probably gonna be disappointed um, because these invasives have quite an artillery. I recommend, you know, divide and conquer, really go through your yard, um, focus on the, the worst of the offenders, um, get some really aggressive natives, like those ones that we call thugs, um, and plant them. And you're, you're pulling out invasives and plant those ones that are, are thuggish behavior, the ones that are like, oh, those take over. Oh, I pulled those out of my yard forever and I can't get them out. Well, that's the kind of thing that you want when you're taking out invasive species. You want the thuggish natives that don't take no for an answer, right? Um, so you can deal with that part later. And in the meantime, you're benefiting the wildlife in the area and hopefully keeping those invasives at bay. Great, thank you. Do you have a list of the thuggish natives or are they one of your kits that you sell? <laughs> we do not, we don't have a kit listed for the thuggish ones. We, we probably will. Every time somebody asks for one, we're like, oh, that'd be a good kit. Um, that is totally dependent on where the problem is. So if you have, um, you, if you have, you know, full sun and dry soil, you would have a completely different plant than you would be planting in a woodland area. Um, I have seen that um, ferns are a great opportunity plant for um, wooded areas when you're pulling out things like bittersweet and stuff like that. If you have a shaded area, if you can plant ferns, what they do, aside from just looking beautiful, they will grow up and they will completely shade the forest floor. Um, and that prevents seedling, like weed seeds from coming up. So ferns are a great option for shaded areas, but really it depends. So like I could make a list <laughs> of all the different plants. If you have sunny and wet, if you have sunny and shady and dry, um, there are different plants that do well in different areas. And um, if you have a, a plant that's listed as aggressive in say sunny and dry, if you put it in a shaded area and a little moisture, it might not do so hot. Um, so it might kind of keep it a little more tame. Um, so that's a way of keeping thuggish plants a little more under control. Okay. If, you do, um, if you do want to do invasive species control, start where it's impacted the least and work your way out from there. Um, and be prepared for a long battle, like put together like a five-year plan here. This isn't going to happen overnight because there's most of the invasives we have spread both by root and by seed. So um, just kind of knowing you're in, in a battle and don't be afraid to just cut things back repeatedly. Instead of pulling, just cutting, cutting, cutting. It's, it's, it, it annoys the plants, it tires them out. They take all their energy from their roots to the new sprouts. And then you keep cutting that sprout and, and you eventually exhaust the plant and they give up in some, some cases. Mm -hmm. um, but also if you've ever tried to pull out a maple right now at this time of year, uh, the, the bark will just pull right off. So like knowing that certain woody species, the cambium, like they're fresh right now, so pulling them is harder than in the fall when they're more, um, they've sent their energy down into the roots as opposed to into the plant where it's like ready to put up a battle. So trying to remember that, but right now it's go time for garlic mustard. Like if you can get on top of the garlic mustard, go for it. And Johnny mentioned kale pesto. You can use the garlic mustard for your pesto too, mm -hmm. but it's go, 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 go for garlic mustard. If, that's your thing to get rid of. And then I've heard that you're supposed to put that in a black plastic bag and throw it away. Yeah. Wow. You know, it's bad. You typically don't want to compost any highly invasive species. I mean, Dolorize it or get rid of it for the most part. You can kind of rot them, you know, like in a bucket with a lid on it and turn it into goop. If you've got a spot in your yard for goop. 
right. Well, on that note, <laughs> I'm Coop Garden. It's time to wrap it up. Um, I assume down. that we can ask you guys for, we could call you for consultations. Is that what you do partly? Um, uh, and or come and help out at Holly Hill Farm and learn a lot that way. Um, but it's a never ending process and, um, and it's true. We all love it. Once you get out there and you get into this, it's pretty much, you know, it can become a life and thank you all for sharing your joy for this with us. Um, thank so you. much information and so much more to learn, obviously, but we really appreciate you being here. Um, we will, to everybody who is on this, um, chat, we will be sending a list of resources, including contact info for all of these guys and um, other websites and stuff that they have used and other people have used for this kind of information. So um, we will email that to you, to all the participants. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about the League of Women Voters, please go to our website. Um, it's lwvhingham.org. And we have a lot of resources on there too about um, these kinds of things, some webinars, this will be posted on there. Um, but then also get involved with the state at the state level as far as advocacy for policies that help with these kinds of things. Um, we are here to help you with that. So join the league if you'd like to. So with that, thank you all. And um, we'll see you soon in the garden and go green. <laughs>